a little bit later than normal because we never had any electricity, but now we do have electricity. I am coming to you today from Zanin, where it is rather chilly, but praise God, nothing as cold as I think the rest of the country is. <laughs> I just want to open in prayer, and then I'm going to introduce somebody incredibly special to me, to you all, and we're going to chat about Jesus and building his kingdom establishing the next generation. Father, I thank you for this beautiful new day. I thank you for your joy, for your peace, for your anointing. I thank you for every single person that will hear this message live today and for everyone that's going to be hearing it in the future. I thank you that we glorify Jesus Christ, the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, and that there is no other King, there is no other name, and there's no other blood but the blood of Jesus that we live by and that we believe in with all of our hearts. Thank you, Holy Spirit, for brooding over us today, for wisdom, for revelation, for the spirit of counsel. And I thank you that you will be glorified, Lord, as we share heart today in Jesus' mighty name. Friends, this is one of my most dearest people in my life, my beautiful friend, Glynis Kennedy Labaskachny that I've known since the end of August, beginning of September, 1993. <laughs> and from the day we met, our hearts were locked. And I'm so privileged to introduce you to this mighty woman of God, a very, very, very dear friend to me, a mother. She's got three incredibly beautiful young adult children. She is a pastor. And she is the principal of a school in Zanin, Davelskloof area. And she's a woman with a heart for the next generation. So, Glynis, it's a real honor for me to interview you today you. and for us to chat about who you are, who Christ is in you, and your heart. Glynis has been establishing the kingdom of God ever since she got radically saved. And her heart has only ever been to see God glorified but her passion is the next generation. So, Glenn, tell me, were you born a Christian? <laughs> <laughs> Anything but. <laughs> Definitely not. I got saved in my second year of studies, <clears throat> just as well, because who knows where I'd be now. But uh, afterwards, I saw how wonderfully Jesus had wooed me into that place. I'd always had a heart for God, always. I'd always had a hunger. I'd always had that feeling of emptiness. But how he strategically placed people and events, puzzle pieces around about me to draw me to him. I got saved in um, a quite a radical church in Pantown, which suited my heart and my passion. And so since then, I have had a heart for, for him and to establish his kingdom on earth, particularly for young people. It's what I studied. And so from the beginning, I trained for junior primary studies, the foundation phase, and started with a combined class of grade one, two, and standard one. And it was wonderful seeing these little kids respond to worship and giving their lives to the Lord at six and seven. And that really ignited a passion for, for what is possible with our children. So, Glenn, I love the way that you said that you introduced them to worship right from the beginning. Do you think that children are too young to learn about the things of Jesus? <laughs> I don't know. Children have such a hunger for more of God from the youngest of age. My daughter, when she was two and a half and my oldest son was five, it was the Easter time and I was telling Kit again about the crucifixion and how Jesus had died for us. And Heather kept coming around me and I sort of kept pushing her off and saying, baby, mommy's talking to Kit, man. And... Um, Kit said he didn't think he wanted to ask Jesus into his life. But Heather was saying, me, mommy, me, I ask Jesus. And so two and a half, she got radically saved. And we saw <laughs> the result in her behavior. And she understood the fullness of his love for her. Not the lifestyle, but the even the grade one students that I've had the opportunity to teach over the years have had a hunger 
for a stability. They need to be loved. They need to know that they cared. And they've wanted a purpose. From the youngest, they've wanted a purpose. My school has a preschool section. So we have children from four years old. And um, they do the most incredible job in exposing them to the basic story of the gospel. And from the beginning, that it's his story and how Jesus established the garden, how the father established the garden and established the human race and how over the generations he's wooed us back. But right from four years old, they're established in worship and they're given the freedom to lift their arms and to sing and dance and they are challenged to go deeper and they're challenged when they're scared to look to him. To, to pray for healing, to pray for the people around about them, to be community minded. So why would we ever think that they are too young? So clearly, <clears throat> do you think that children can receive the power of the Holy Spirit? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. And are you able to lead them into an encounter with Jesus? Yes, oh yes, absolutely. When children are wounded and need healing, they need to feel a tangible touch of the Lord. And, and so by teaching them that, it, it makes such a difference. Years ago, we spent a weekend, uh, I don't know, 10 of my teachers spent a weekend in Joburg. And we came back and actively after that conference, we started leading children into, into encounters. And one of my grade three teachers had come back to children really nervous about their first formal assessment, and it happened to be a maths assessment, and how she sat them down as a class and encouraged them to find a safe place with him, and she led them into an encounter. And it was the most incredible thing to hear how they finished their test, did incredibly well, and with such peace. And when she was asking them after the encounter what they experienced, their reaction was, ma'am, I felt so warm, or I felt someone sitting next to me, and I realized I didn't have to be afraid. So definitely with, with loving and mentoring and insight from the teaching staff, that it is very available. What would you say the greatest difficulty is today in the education that we are facing and our young people who don't seem to be interested in the things of God? I think that that's a two-pronged question because education today, not Christian education, is gearing the students away from the gospel. The gospel is presented as a fairy tale, happily live ever after, but it's not life. It's not reality. It's not scientific. Plus, our learners have an incredible pressure. We all know that. We all know that the worldly, the secular viewpoint in rubber stamping things, for example, from evolution, it's not just lifestyle, but from things like that, there is an incredible pressure on them to conform to worldly standards. When you have Christian children, either in your home or in your youth, or as I'm involved in, in our classes, they then have an added pressure that they have one foot in each world. Where I come from, my school is very diverse, multicultural. And so, so many of my children come out of homes where the parents are nominal Christians and very often gogos or guardians that they live with are committed ancestral worshippers. And so they, it is so difficult for them to establish one lifestyle at school and then to go home and live it in the fullness. I think that we as believers, even if you're not involved in education, we need to be considering the next generation, our ultimate priority, and we need to be warring on their behalf. And so with, the, with this conflict between a home life and a, 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 a teacher or a school that is imparting Christianity into their lives, are you finding it difficult to bring the truth? Or how do you go about helping them to search for truth for themselves? 
I am in an incredibly privileged scenario where I head up a Christian school. And we, as I said, we have children from four all the way up to grade 12, where our children, it's not just a nominal Christian school. Our children are literally like rusks dunked into Christianity, into the lifestyle, into kingdom. And they are mentored into the fullness. They are challenged to not just to give their lives to the Lord, not just glory, hallelujah, you're safe, you're going to go to heaven, but to walk in the fullness of that, to experience him, to be baptized, to be filled with the Holy Spirit. And they're actively encouraged to get involved in the community. Also, the peer pressure is very positive at school. And so it's one thing to have Christians who just happen to be teachers in, but, but we are Christian teachers. So our school and our lives are dedicated to mentoring children through their hurts into a place of healing and wholeness and where they understand the future is theirs, that it's not ours and that they will walk in the fullness of what God's called them to be. Even then, it's really difficult where in our fatherless society, where males and, and the girls come to school and they are wounded. There are also very real responsibilities where um, they're growing up in child-headed homes or where grandparents, parents are in the city working and they very seldom see them. So our circumstances in society today are really difficult and then my staff have to fulfill those roles and lead the children into some place of healing. Would you see what you do as a job? Or do you feel that this is something that is a calling and an anointing to establish the kingdom of God? <laughs> we were talking about salaries the other day in a, a trip. And um, I sort of said to them, well, I know that I am where God is, where God wants me to be. And I'd probably come back even if I didn't earn a salary. I think that some of the teachers feel very differently. <laughs> But as educators and people who work in ministry with children, we all understand that it has to be a calling. It has to be a passion. And so God has, I believe with my whole heart, God handpicks people and puts them into positions of, of authority and influence with young people because it's so desperate that we change their lives. Lenny, with this whole confusion that we've seen in gender confusion and we've seen it in religious confusion and all the absolutes have been removed and now what is evil is called good. How do you journey this and still stand for truth and righteousness without appearing judgmental? So as an example, over the years, we have had three students who have been very confused about their gender. Two of the boys openly opened up to the man who inputs them spiritually while they were in primary school. And so he particularly has been able to walk a road with them. The one is gloriously born again and healed and in a position of influence at school. The other young man is still is still battling. So because of those scenarios, particularly in the different classrooms, is that we have had to talk about loving people to a place of wholeness and that we as Christians are restorative. So our discipline even has to be restorative. And for us as parents, for us as teachers, we are walking children to a place of healing and wholeness. So what I'm hearing you saying <clears throat> is that you don't see educating children as something you do from nine to five, but you actually see it as caring for the person and trying to do what's best for the person. Am I hearing you correctly? Well, education is done from the moment those learners open their eyes to the time they go to sleep. And so many of us need to be preparing our hearts, preparing our classrooms and praying, praying for those children who are battling, praying for the children who have been sexually abused. Um, 
and and have had other instances of things go on at home and also to be available to them when they don't have the freedom to chat in terms of classroom it is a lifestyle and it's a lifelong commitment and so um preparing the next generation for the future and the reality of the world we cannot lead them into a place where they can't stand and face the world and as you've mentioned you've had people that have been contaminated and broken by the world that you already had to deal with what do you feel the responsibility of the educator is to prepare him and herself better again this is a two-pronged plug because this doesn't just happen at school the reality is our kids get to spend a huge chunk of their day at school with educators. And so we, in that sense, have the opportunity to be the primary mentors and modelers of who Jesus is. I think that in terms of, of lifestyle, we place a safe space for them and we need to I read an article in a Christian journal a little while ago that I, I wanted to quote and I forgot to look it up, where the author talks about exposing the children to the beautiful but broken world. And so often Christian children who come from Christian homes are placed in cotton wool. And so there is a huge shock when they get to university and they have to face the real world. And we as Christian parents, as Christian ministries in churches, we have to make sure that not only are we leading our students to Jesus and we are binding them to him and dealing with hurts and brokenness, but we need to be preparing them for the world. My son, who's grown up in my home, he got to university and he phoned me and, Mom, we have to learn uh, evolution. Yeah, Josh. He said, but I don't know how to tell him the truth. And so I had a number of long conversations with him over the phone, talking to him about scientific proof. And that was such a wake up call for me personally, because I realized I had to set different standards and stronger standards with the, the learners who are placed in my care. So, Glenny, would you say that there is a different level of responsibility for parents at this point of time to be able to pre prepare their children not only to have a standard, a strong personal relationship with Jesus, but to know what they're going to be facing and to be prepared for that? I think that the curse, if I can put it as strongly as that, of children's church is that so many parents have said, well, it's the church's job to educate their children spiritually. And they go once a week to youth and to Sunday school. And so glory, hallelujah, where actually the um, that's just a blessing and a supplement. That's having fun and fellowship around the world. And we as parents have to understand that it is our responsibility ultimately to be able to input our children, to be able to put barriers in place. And we as adults understand the pull of the world. We as adults understand how dangerous society is, how anti-Christian society is, particularly in this modern secular society where there are no absolutes and there are no right and wrong. And if you want to even establish absolutes for your own life, you are considered prejudiced and biased. So we have to be preparing our learners for the future and our children that we tend as educators and as parents to think we're releasing our children into the world that we went into but it's very very different Lenny, one of the things we were chatting about previously as you've said that we are having to father a fatherless society and we know that it's the fathers <clears throat> um, that god created in such a way that the fathers give identity to their children so a how do you look at this fathering a fatherless society? <coughs> and <coughs> excuse me. Excuse us, we both have a bit of a cough with all this cold we've been <laughs> facing. So just excuse the coughs. But how do you how do you manage fathering a fatherless society? And do you think 
that there could be a link between gender confusion, people not knowing their identity, and the fact of a fatherless society. What would be your comments? So there are a number of aspects to this fatherless society. Statistics are horrendous that there are approximately 76% of uh, all students in South Africa come out of one parent homes. In my Just repeat that a minute. How what seventy six percent of South African learners come out of one parent home? Now that is <coughs> that is an incredible. <coughs> Excuse me. <laughs> well, it's not me coughing right now, which I'm so happy to say. But that is an incredible statistic for us to know, because friends, seventy six percent of for children in this generation coming out of fatherless societies, fatherless homes, do we understand what that is doing to the next generation? The reason that I really wanted to spend time <coughs> chatting with Glynis <coughs> is because if we, as the body of Christ, if we, as the priesthood of all believers, if we, as those that have been called to serve our King and our Lord Jesus Christ, do not seriously open our eyes and reach out to a generation that is being bombarded by the ways of this world, the God of this world, the media of this world, and they have no one that is able to help them to know who they are, to make a stand and an, a deep understanding of who they are, and therefore, to step out in confidence and assurance and acceptance into the world to try and be who they've been created to be, we truly will have a generation lost. Mm -hmm. And friends, Glynis is a woman that I have known personally for many years, as I've said, that has never wavered in her stand for God, that is passionate about seeing a generation rise up and be all that they were created to be, and who is confronted daily as a principal of a school that has taught every age group in the school with the brokenness of the reality of where our children are at. And I want yeah. to say they are not, the next generation is not our enemy. No. They are our responsibility. So, Glynis, what do you feel? I just want to finish please that. Do. Please um, do. I want to interrupt you. So in my community, my school is in a peri-urban area, and I interview most of the parents who want to put their children in the school. And I can count probably on two hands, perhaps three hands, of parents who both parents live together with a student in my community. Um, masses of my students' parents are divorced, but in my area, so many of my students are living with guardians and aunts and gogos because their parents financially have to live in the city to earn finances. And this is the reality that so many of our students are going through. Mothers are battling, they're at home very seldom, and students are left to just do what they need to do. Because of that, Online entertainment is so freely available with all of its dangers. And girls are desperate for attention. And so they are going into sexual relationships because of the attention that they're getting. And boys are growing up with two aspects of, of fathering. You have some who are incredibly sensitive, who allow women to dominate because that's their lifestyle, is the dominant dominant authority has been matriarchal or you have the toxic masculinity where boys believe that they need to rule with an iron fist and that's part of the reason for the gender abuse that South Africa's seen at the moment. So as you teaching the next generation how are you helping them to understand the need for fathers or even how are you filling that role of trying to father a fatherless society parents have to be educated that even if they live far away that they are they need to be part of their their children's lives and so that's parent training but from a student point of view again because that's my place of reference is that those learners have 
to be brought to a place of healing and they need to be taught to be mentored. They need to see kingdom living. They need to see what God has planned for his people. They need to see the Garden of Eden where Adam and Eve worked together and it was good and there was a healthy balance as opposed to the societal picture of where marriage and commitment and relationships are really weak. And, and men are allowed to do what they like, and women are allowed to live the way they would like to, lifestyle. Have you found it very difficult to fulfill your conviction as being a Christian, leading a school, and to be able to make a stand against whatever obligations and laws they're trying to bring into education to force things that are very humanistic and very liberal? That again has a number of sides, is that being an independent school, we have freedom to use our own curriculum as long as it lines up with the government's CAPS curriculum. And we are able to teach life skills from a biblical perspective. And we really have been fortunate enough to, to experience that freedom. The examination system that we use, some of the material that is required of us is not, definitely not Christian. But even so, the teachers who are obliged to teach it are teaching it from a Christian standpoint. So the novels that we teach, we use as life lessons and life skills. So over and above teaching the literature and the literary styles, so we have a we are able to input lifestyle questions through them. We teach evolution because we have to, but it is balanced by the Christian aspect and the the lie that is so often propagated by the theory of evolution. In my um, district, there is a regional district manager who has signed that no Christian activities are to take place in the government schools and no pastors are allowed to attend or to teach anything in the government schools in his district. So the people that we know who are in ministry are finding it incredibly difficult where witch doctors have free access to students that teachers are not allowed to pray or take students through deliverance when necessary. And the moment there's a problem that Adris Angoma or a witch doctor is called in to the school. So what you're saying <clears throat> is that it is, it is absolutely fine for any school to usher in a Sangoma or a witch doctor and to have them come into the school, pray in the school, counsel the children, but that Christian input, prayer and pastoring is prohibited. Again, it depends on the principal particularly and his governing body. So, <clears throat> excuse me, um, some of the more urban schools are very open to allowing people from churches in to minister to their children and often have Bible classes where the Muslims can get together for that hour and the Jewish people can get together and then some of the churches are represented. Some of the traditional Afrikaans schools really do with open arms welcome religious teachers in. But in terms of the new awakening of ethnic society going back to the roots, often then Christianity is seen as the white man's religion that is colonial and they are embracing the ancestral worship that they believe is the truth. What <clears throat> would you advise parents today? Could you maybe just give a few pointers to parents today where they may not have realized exactly how, how different the schools are now in this new era and in this new season. What counsel would you give to parents about their children and about their children's education? Christian parents, it is essential that you are an integral part of your um, students, your child's education. You need to be seeing what is taught, what set books are being used. 
and it's essential that you know parents, that you are involved in the school's governing body, because this way you get to be a part of the decisions that are made in your school. You have a voice. It's really important that you build up relationships with your children's parents so that they understand your heart, but more than that, you can be chatting to them about the importance of lifestyle and what they're teaching and how they're teaching it. You cannot allow the world to bring up your children. It's way past that time. <clears throat> I like what you just said. You cannot allow the world to bring up your children. So you do believe that there's a greater responsibility for parents to step up and to step in. Absolutely. I think the choice is in our hands. We have to decide what we want our children to look like later on. And do we want them? to resemble the world? Do we want them to go into society as broken people? Or do we want them representing the kingdom? And that choice is literally in our hands. Because number one, we need to lay that foundation in our homes. We need to have, they need to have the freedom to come and talk to us about anything. We need to be exposing them to that broken but beautiful world, giving them an explanation of what's going on but giving them the freedom and the protection of knowing how to stand against that and definitely we have to know who is influencing their lives that includes a friendship circle and it includes who's teaching them ballet and who's teaching them sports and rugby and what would you say the influence of media or or the the influence of watching computer or playing games um how would you say that can influence a child i think that needs three hours all on its own that again statistically it is horrendous the input that media and games are having on our learners i don't know how aware you are is that an hour of online input be that social media or games is equal to one line of cocaine it has the same dopamine effect on your brain the same addiction the feel good and then the addiction effect on your brain so we need to understand as christians a for example so many of the games have an age restriction on them 16 and above Parents don't know that. And so you have children of nine playing games that they should never be involved in because of the level of violence. Another thing that parents are not aware of is that you go into a chat room or a gaming room and your children are playing against people who might be a 45 year old man and they're exposed to perhaps his swearing, his aggression. And again, that child might be an 11 or a 12 year old. <clears throat> that is over and above the exposure to pornography. Again, statistically, that most of our students have their first exposure to pornography by age nine. And again, that's in the 90s. I can't remember exactly what that percentage is, but more than 90% of our students get exposed to some form of pornography in South Africa by the time that they are nine. That's scary stuff. And so the, the importance of us regulating our children's screen time and what they're exposed to on TikTok and Instagram. Parents, if you are a Christian parent and you do not know your child's password, if you have not loaded some form of watchdog parental control onto their phones, I promise you that you're failing your children. These are, these are strong words that Glynis is using today, but I really want to say this to you. We cannot sit back and blame the church mm -hmm. that we walk living a lukewarm life and blame the church that our children are lost and blame the school yeah. that our children are not getting the education that they want. Friends, yeah. the word of God says, train up a child in the way that they are to should go. And when they are old, they will not depart therefrom. That is a promise. Mm -hmm. 
If you want your children to grow up in the way that they should go, it is vital that your home represents Amen. Jesus, Amen. that the lifestyle in Amen. your home represents Jesus. That means, mom, you've got to be aware of what you're watching. That means, dad, you've got to be aware of what you're watching. That means the example that you set is an example of holiness, righteousness, and purity. That means the kingdom of heaven has to be established in your home first. The altars have to be established in your home. Your children need to know that they come home, that they can sit at a table, that they can talk to their parents yes. about anything. Amen. Moms, if you feel embarrassed to talk about sex, to talk about puberty, to talk about bisexual relationships, to talk about any form of gender confusion with your young children, and I'm talking about 10, 11, 12, with your teenage children. It is vital that you ask God to give you the grace and to give you the right information to be able to equip them in the way that they should go in truth and righteousness. We do not help our children by never talking about things. Because they want answers and they're going to look for the answers in the wrong places. Mm -hmm. They're going to listen to their peers. Mm -hmm. They're going to listen to the most sordid person they know. But when they know the truth, Glynis, what sort of education system do you offer? Or what? how do you equip your young teenage girls in the things, and boys, in the things that are pure sexuality? I think, again, this is something that we as parents need to realize, that you cannot deal with it when your child is 11 or 12 or when she has her first period. That we've all been exposed to Disney's revelations. Yes. That, that what is portrayed as safe and secure and childlike is very dangerous. One of the greatest hooks in society at the moment to draw children into porn sites is there are a number of cartoon pornography sites. And so we've got to understand that our children from a young age are being drawn into pornography. They are being groomed. And it is our responsibility, <clears throat> excuse me, to to really protect our kids from that physically in putting guards on our phones, but but taking these cell phones and having a look at who they're talking to, what they're watching. Probably the most important thing is I'd always said I wanted my children to learn about sex and the beauty they are from me and not in the bathrooms at school. In a lot of cases, that is what's happening, is that parents are too embarrassed to talk to children about not just the basic things like wet dreams, but the, the beauty of intimacy between a husband and a wife and covenant relationships. And I think that in talking to the children honestly and openly and exposing them to what God's plan looks like and the protection so many children see that as a restrictive, they can't go out. But it opens them to, well, my mother's so conservative, and so I'm just going to go and see what real life looks like. The reality is, is that as we expose them to the beauty of his plan, as we expose them to exposing them to their, their purpose and their plan that God has for them, and how decisions made as young people impact, impact their future and and God's purpose and plan. It's really important that we are open with them, that we speak truth, and again, that we mentor them into the fullness thereof. Your children know far more about sex than what you think. And so we've tried to protect them and not talked about, in our view, nasty sexual practices that our children don't know anything about. I can guarantee you they do. You know, there's a saying that goes that in the bank, they never, ever expose the tellers to counterfeit money mm. until they have absolutely got to know real money so well, the feel of it, 
and what it looks like, what it feels like, that they've dealt with it so much that they can pick up the counterfeit straight away. And friends, I think that is the truth. Mm -hmm. When our children are exposed to purity, to to godliness, to gloriness, to what it actually looks like, to what the beauty of God's kingdom looks like, when they've been exposed to a natural conversation at home where it's been the most natural thing on earth to talk yeah. about these things, they don't want that which is sordid and that which is ugly and that which is contaminated. But it starts at home. And I think it's really important. And and the one thing that has really stood in my heart to share with you today as well, and I'm going to ask Linus comment on it, but so many Many times as parents, we put so much focus on our children having to be perfect. Yeah on our children having to achieve. This world system, and I've spoken about this so often, is about striving and about being the best and achieving because we live in a competitive world. But the kingdom of God is not a competitive world, friends. The kingdom of God is you are uniquely and wonderfully made, and you are what he wants you to be. And he compares nobody with nobody. He makes you unique. And so many parents are so horrified and shocked and disappointed and even revolted when their young teenagers make a mistake. When in their, in their zeal with no wisdom, they make a mistake, they, they fall, they may get drunk one night, they may, they may dabble with, with substance abuse, they may, go, they may go partaking of something because they are zealous and they are silly and there's peer pressure. They may even fall pregnant. That, that young person is rejected by the parents that feel they have been disappointed. Yeah. Look what you've done to me. What will people say about me because you've done that? Mm -hmm. And friends, that is horrendous because the truth of the matter is that is pure pride mm -hmm. and it's saying that you believe in a system mm -hmm. that is about striving and your child only has worth when they're perfect. Yeah. And that is why so many people live in rejection, feel worthless, and have no value in their own lives mm -hmm. because they've tried to live up to something where they had to be perfect. And if they made a mistake, they were disqualified. Yeah. And I want to say today the church is good at disqualifying people, Amen. but we're not good at helping the broken come into wholeness, mm -hmm. fullness, and into maturity. And you know the most amazing thing about Jesus? He always looked for the broken, Amen. and he qualified the broken. And I want to say to you today, friends, it is vital that we stop putting pressure on our children to be what you think they should be to make you look good. Glynis, how do you feel about this? I think that as Christian parents is that we have to realize there is a worldly system and there's a spiritual system. And we can do everything we can in our power to make them achieve in the worldly system, academically, gym, extra maths lessons, swimming lessons. <coughs> <coughs> <laughs> but as you say, excuse me, we're ultimately setting them up for failure because spiritual values are very, very different. And they need to learn about honoring one another. For example, is that they need to, from young, be actively involved in community. They need to see people who are less fortunate than them, that it is they can and should be making a difference. And they can and should be reaching out to the community in, in generosity, in prayer, in leading people to the Lord. For example, one of my grade nine classes, the, the different grades could choose what outreach they wanted to do. And one of my grade nine um, classes asked if they could spoil our ground staff because they're faithful. And I was blown away by that because we think outreach, the old age home, the um, poor community down the road, and they organized a meal, the finances, they cooked, they waited, they decorated the table, they provided entertainment, and then they washed their feet. And I said to the grade nine, don't you feel that they would be uncomfortable? And this young lass looked up at me and she said, ma'am, Jesus washed people's feet. Why would they feel uncomfortable if we do it? And that spoke so to my heart because 
There is a lifestyle and a heart that we need to be breeding, literally breeding in our children, exposing them to, that they walk and talk who Jesus is to the community. I love that. So would you say that taking children to be exposed to that which is under underprivileged, that which is desperate to be able to see yes to be able to see people that are homeless to be able to see people that have great needs to actually give them a burden for community and society that is focused not on themselves but others would you maybe just talk with us about that a little bit more so pre-covid we had again from a, a school perspective we had two groups who went into an informal settlement and whatever if we had things to give away they do that they basically walked around prayed and led people to the lord so one of the instances i can think of an old lady who was blind she was healed then we had a group go into a local preschool, also in a poorer community. We had a group who went into the old age home, and that alone was a testimony. A traditional, most of the people in it were Afrikaans. And when the one young black boy wanted to pray for one of the old whims, he didn't want to even touch him. After, I think, perhaps three or four weeks of taking them biscuits and praying for them and sitting, chatting, they were holding hands. And the same old Wami kept asking this young, passionate black man to come and sit and to talk to him. And they prayed together. And that those issues change the students' lives, but they change people's lives in the community. Our grades go down and downtown, they hand out bread, and as they hand out bread, they talk about the living bread. And they lead people to the Lord. They need to see that they can make a difference financially. They can take authority in intercession. I was interested to hear on Sunday we had a conversation. Just below the school, there is a really high picturesque waterfall. And a witch doctor has been living there. When we found out he was back, the spiritual head of the high school took some of the students, I think grade 11s, and they went down, walked around, prayed, cleaned the land. And someone that I know on Sunday had gone down, taken her children there, and there was no sign of him. So the students, the, our young people need to understand that they have authority and that they can be making a difference in every aspect of society. Lynn, it's been such an incredible time and opportunity to talk with you. I want to just say for those that have come in later on that Glynis is a pastor, She's a principal of a school. She has great influence in her area of influence. She has taught every age of children, <laughs> and she still teaches children. She still has impartation with children, but she also equips teachers on how to be better educators because that's what it is. Mm. It's about educating. But, friends, she also equips parents on how to be better at bringing up the next generation and training them in the way that they should go. And I want to say to parents watching me today, it is really important for you to take more responsibility Amen. for your children. Amen. You know, one day when we come before God, he's going to say, what did you do with the children that I gave you? Because they are his children. Mm. He's given them to you on loan. Mm. He hasn't given them to a nanny and he hasn't given them to a granny yes. and he hasn't given them to Amen. a school or to a, an organization he gave them to you now so many of us spent hundreds of thousands of rands on getting our children into a good school what is the definition of a good school is it good academics is it to have a child of perfection leave on the other end who's broken and cannot face the world yeah or is it a school that equips them how to live how to care about other people how to reach the community how to be able to become more than self-centered our children would not be spending so much time on tranquilizers and antidepressants if they actually could look around them and see how terrible the situations is in other people's lives 
How do you feel about medication and keeping children in a place of inward looking limits? There's a number of things that I want to say beforehand. If you don't influence your children, the world will. There are a number of really dangerous influences on social media that your parent, your children are watching. And they have really scary viewpoints, but they are so popular. And what they say and what they believe goes viral. You need to check. Number two, medication. Students are put on medication so quickly and so easily because there's got to be a reason. And it's a medical reason. And so it takes the responsibility of my parenting off of me. It can't possibly be my problem. I can't possibly have a diet problem where my child is fed sweets and rubbish um, and he can't concentrate because of that. It's far easier to feed him medication because he can't concentrate, not because he's undisciplined, because there's a medical reason. It's far easier to give a child an antidepressant rather than deal with the hurt and the fear that comes from an insecurity issue. It's far easier to put a child in a clinic when she's battling with self-image and she's developing anorexia. Parents, we are responsible for our child's well-being, spiritually, emotionally, and physically, and drugs don't do it. Sometimes the reality is sometimes we do need drugs as a short term measure that cannot be a go to. God made doctors, he made medicine, but there's far more than just dumping responsibility onto the medical field, onto psychologists and psychiatrists, where we as parents need to be making a stand. We need to be loving our students. We need to be listening to them for what they to what their issues are, what their heart is. And we need to be praying over them regularly, regularly laying our hands on them and blessing them over and above just praying for them intercessory wise for, for success. Do you, um, just in talking about blessing our children, Glynis, do you see any effects on the way people speak over their children? Do you see a difference between people that speak life and those that are quick to criticize and break down? Absolutely. Absolutely. There are parents who affirm their children and there are parents who break down their children. Obviously, we know as Christians which works. And I have had students that have sat in my office with parents who've been on the point of expulsion. And that parent has um, absolutely spoken against what the child has done and condemned the action and affirmed the child. And that child has blossomed, come back to school because there's been love and affirmation and boundaries have been set. We've had other cases in more than one school where children have been disciplined in the normal school scenario and parents have fought and sided with a child, blamed children, made excuses that the behavior wasn't so bad and that child never i can't say never that's a really absolute but very seldom does that pet does that child walk into a place of healing and wholeness we can have a conversation for another couple of hours because glennis has got so much to offer and this journey is so intricate and there's such a reality <clears throat> of our parenting having to change, that we cannot parent our children from a distance. We cannot offer them. So many of us want to offer our children the best of the best, mm. but we never actually hands on. We don't actually give them what they want. We don't actually give them what they need. Amen. And that is you. Your children need you. Yeah, yeah. They need your contact. They need your your um, influence in their life. Mm -hmm. They need your interest in what they're doing. They need you to be present. They need you. Mm -hmm. And they need Jesus. Mm -hmm. And I really want to say to you today, friends, if you call yourself a Christian, if you're born again, and you know our incredible Lord Jesus Christ, you have an incredible responsibility for your own children. 
that is your responsibility and the way that you parent your children Amen. will rub off onto those that have not been parented Amen. and your children we, will become a light in a dark place they will become somebody that will bring people home and you will find yourself without realizing it yeah. becoming having a ministry to fathering the fatherless yes. because your home will become a place yes. that people come and drink yes. at the well of what you've got to give it's not your money that's going to do that Amen. friends Amen. it is who you are Amen. and the influence that you can give and i'm going to ask linus to say a, a few one or two words to the parents and then to close and pray but i really want to say this to you today i felt god say that i needed to spend time just uh, interviewing Glynny and letting her share just some of her passion and some of her heart and we haven't even scratched on the surface because when it comes to being passionately in love with Jesus and passionately in love with the next generation this woman's veins tick with that <laughs> bursting within her and I just know that she's got so much more to share to offer to guide to give to teach and to equip parents children and the next generation she is incredibly um aware of everything that they are facing at every level as a multicultural school they've had to literally deal with everything and there have been some very important children that have come through her school and children with with incredible destinies we haven't even had time to talk about some of the children that have left and gone on and made a mark in the world and maybe there could be a possible next time one day when i'm back in zanin but what i want to say to you today parents your children are the most valuable thing you have they are not your enemies Amen. you don't have to battle through the season of parenting Amen. so that they can leave your home one day and you can get on with your life right. this is your greatest ministry the season that your children are with you and not only them but every other child that their lives touch mm -hmm. because that child that other child may never be touched with the gospel but for you and the influence you've got on your children we're going to close with Glenny saying just whatever's still on her heart i've given her carte blanche to do whatever god shows her <clears throat> and then she's going to pray thank you i think biblically we know God's blessing is to our children and our children's children and to our children's children's children. Yes. That is the influence that you have on your children. A number of times in the Old Testament, when the enemy rose up against the Israelites, they were called to pray. It was so important that honeymoons were postponed for people to come and pray. But children were brought into that prayer time and they prayed as a nation, they prayed as families. You think of Jesus as a child. Where was he? He was in the tabernacle. He was in the, the temple. And so our children belong in our lives, in our spiritual lives. From young, we involve them. God gave you the, the responsibility of being your child's primary influencer, not your pastor, not the youth leader, you. And so as you rise up and draw them into the fullness of who they are, you model them, you mentor them, you love them, you restore them Beautiful. in who Jesus is. You will bless your children, and your children's children, and your children's children's children. And it will be a lineage of honor the same way Timothy's mother and his grandmother were credited with this young man's passion for Jesus. And so you, as parents, can change the world. In as much as we are wanting the next generation to go out and to change South Africa, because our country's future lies in their hands. As much as we are wanting them to impact the future, you hold that future in your hands as parents. I'm always reminded of it took one lady mm. to change our country, and that was Mandela's mom. Moms, you can change a country. Mm. Why'd you pray for us, mm. Father, I bless you. I bless you for our next generation. I thank you that you gave us children as a blessing. 
Oh, oh God, I thank you for that. And I thank you that we, as Christian educators, as people in ministry, God, but more importantly, as Christian parents, will rise up. God, I pray for such an anointing, Father, for us, such words that will come straight from your heart, that will influence and mold our children. God, I thank you that our homes will be springboards to push them into where you would have them be. God, far further than what we could even dream of doctors and lawyers, but Jesus into the fullness of the purposes and plans that you have. I thank you for ministers, prime ministers, God, for, for people of influence in every avenue of society, that you will draw our people who are passionate about you and that God truly, they will change the world. In Jesus' name, amen. Trini, thank you for giving me this time. Friends, <clears throat> I really pray that today you've been stirred. Pray, rise up, fight for, parent, amen. show the next generation what it is to be a child amen. of God. Fire, glory, supernatural, encountering Jesus, yeah. knowing for in their own hearts and in their own lives who he is, the King of kings, the Lord of lords, yeah. and letting that little fire go into wherever it is God's got for them so that they can confidently know they don't have to be influenced by the things around them, but that they can be a magnet drawing the broken to them yeah. and always be ready to offer redemption. God bless you, friends. Yeah. Thank you. Until we meet again, thank you, Glenny. It's my pleasure. It's an honor to have been invited into your homes. Goodbye, friends.